We're going to come back today into Ephesians chapter number 1 and continue our series uh, through this uh, tremendous New Testament epistle. And today we're going to read Paul's prayer uh, together that he is offering uh, on the behalf of these Ephesian believers and the surrounding uh, area there in, uh, inside of Asia. So Ephesians chapter number 1, and we're going to pick up our reading inside of verse number 17 and read through uh, the remainder of this passage. Verse number 17, Paul writes, "...that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened." that ye may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward who believe according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come." And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Last week, uh, we looked into Paul's transition from stating certain emphatic truths concerning our salvation to then readying himself to pray for these specific believers. And as we have already seen, generally speaking, those whom Paul will pray for here have a testimony that has convinced the apostle that they are authentic believers. Two notable expressions of their salvation here uh, mentioned inside of this context were their faith in the Lord Jesus and their love for all the saints. And these two qualities of life uh, of, their, of these individuals' testimony has thoroughly convinced Paul that these are genuine believers. And Paul seems to be overwhelmed with hearing of their outstanding Christian testimony, which causes him to unceasingly thank God for them as he mentions them often in his prayers. And by understanding really who Paul is praying for here, we can better appreciate what is said in the actual prayer itself. In other words, it helps to give us theological soundness to the prayer that Paul here offers. For example, when, when Paul prays inside of Romans chapter number 1, uh, he states that he is thankful for these individuals' faith that is spoken of throughout the whole world. But who is it that Paul is actually referencing as he is praying? Who is Paul talking about? Where well, earlier inside of Romans chapter number 1, he has pinpointed them as the called of Jesus Christ. He also references them as the saints. And just think about it for a moment. Paul is thanking God that these individuals' faith is spoken of in Romans 1, throughout the whole world. Now, would it make sense for the apostle to be referencing those who have never came to faith in Jesus Christ? Well, of course not. That's, that's kind of a simplistic question. Of course, Paul wouldn't be thankful for someone's faith to be spoken of throughout the whole world if they weren't genuine believers. So this, again, just kind of helps, helps us understand and have a theological soundness through the prayer of Paul. Paul is thanking God, Romans 1, for their faith that is spoken of throughout the whole world, and the there that is mentioned in that passage are those that are the called of Jesus Christ, those that are considered to be saints, and he's thankful for them. Again, later on in the book of Romans, chapter number 10, Paul is going to pray for certain ones to be saved. In Romans chapter number 10, he's not praying for the same crowd that he was praying for in the initial passage inside of Romans chapter number 1. In Romans chapter 10, he identifies those that he is praying for as Israelites. Israelites who have established their own standard of righteousness and therefore have become ignorant of the only righteousness that God accepts. And so these are, these are pharisaical individuals, uh, people that have gone about to establish their own righteousness. They were, they were those that said, um, they said, well, God really cares more about these things than He does these other things, so we can meet this, and therefore because we adhere by these standards, then, then everything will be okay in between us and God. And Paul says, such individuals are in desperate need of salvation, and so he prays, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So again, in Romans 1, Paul is praying for those who were already saved, and he's thanking God that their faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. In Romans 10, Paul is praying for those who have not been saved, but maybe think that they're saved because they have some different form of righteousness than God actually does. 
And so Paul prays for those lost individuals in Romans 10 to be saved. Again, this kind of just clears up any theological confusion. It wouldn't make sense for Paul to thank God for the faith of unbelievers in Romans 1, and it wouldn't make sense for Paul to pray for the salvation of genuine believers in Romans chapter number 10. So here in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul is praying for, specifically, the Bible tells us, for the saints. And Paul is praying for those throughout, Roman, uh, throughout Ephesians 1 who have been blessed, chosen, predestinated, accepted, redeemed, forgiven, abounded towards, made known unto, and those who have obtained an inheritance. Now this kind of summarizes for us what we looked at together last Sunday. Today we're going to begin looking into the actual content of this prayer. And we're going we're gonna to call this a prayer to know. A prayer to know because in this prayer, Paul is praying for certain knowledge to be realized by these believers. And I'm sure that we won't get through this entire prayer that Paul offers, these seven verses or so, uh, but, uh, but we'll get through as much of it as we can today and we'll come back to it next Sunday. Here's, here's the big thing that I want to present to us today, and that is the overall theme of this prayer. The overall theme of this prayer. Uh, we could call verses 17 and the first part of verse number 18 the introduction section of this prayer. An introduction in regards to who is it that Paul is praying for, rather what is it that the apostle is going to pray for as he prays for these saints. Well, he's going to spell that out for us in, uh, in several different ways. Really, by using several different expressions, he's going to reveal to us exactly what it is that he desires for these believers. Uh, Paul begins by addressing Jehovah by a peculiar title. He mentions, verse number 17, that He is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a designation of God which links God the Father to Christ the Son in terms of essential nature. And in this prayer, Paul is going to ask the Father to give believers a true comprehension and appreciation of who they are in Christ and what they have. And this will in return begin to give them some idea of what wonderful and unlimited blessings they have already attained and received by virtue of their new birth experience. And this is going to unfold for us one of the greatest achievements of Christianity. One of the greatest achievements of Christianity is not getting something extra added to us. One of the greatest achievements of Christianity is for us to just simply realize more and more what has already been supplied to us in our conversion experience. You and I live in a day and age where many believers are constantly searching for something more in the Christian life. They're searching for something extra, something beyond the normal things associated with Christianity. And so many people are looking for some deeper life experience, some, some addendum, some, uh, some additional experience. They, they want some emphoriatic uh, thing to take place that, uh, that you know, is kind of exclusive, kind of premier, something that no one else really gets to experience but here inside of this prayer, Paul doesn't speak of what they need to further obtain inside of their Christian life. He rather prays that these individuals would realize what they have already obtained or already been supplied with. And so all we need and are intended to have for ourselves as believers was supplied to us the moment that we first believed. And that's, the, that's really the essence of what the apostle is presenting all throughout Ephesians 1 and specifically inside of this prayer that he begins to offer to God on the behalf of these believers. Paul is going to major on emphasizing that these believers have already been supplied with everything that they need to live the victorious Christian life. And Peter speaks of this same theme in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 3. Here's what Peter says. And Peter says, according as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. What does is, what is Peter, Peter say? Well, Peter says that God in His sovereign divine power has already given unto us everything that pertains to this life and everything that pertains to godly, sanctified living. Now, Peter, in essence, then says... You don't have to wait around for some additional work of the Spirit. You don't have to wait around for some second blessing, uh, uh, some, uh, some dramatic performance to take place inside of your life. 
You don't have to pray for it. You don't have to seek it. You don't have to wait around. What does Peter say? Peter says the moment you believed, God has already, according to His ultimate sovereign divine power, has already given, supplied us with everything pertaining, he says, to life and godliness. The New Testament explicitly teaches us that our new birth then supplies us with everything that we need in Christ. Paul's already alluded to that back in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 3 where he says that we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now that simply means that if we have been placed into Christ, then every spiritual need, every spiritual resource, every spiritual blessing has already been supplied to us. It's exactly what Paul says in Ephesians 1.3. We have been blessed with all spiritual blessings. Now, now the word all here is in reference to everything that we were intended to receive. And specifically mentioning the, uh, the believers here in Ephesus, uh, Paul is simply saying to them, uh, that, that you've gotten everything. God has already given to you everything that, that He intends for you to have as believers to live godly in Christ Jesus in this present evil world. Were there other spiritual realities that God could have given to them? Were there, were there dreams and revelations and, and uh, supernatural experiences that they could have had? Absolutely, there were, there were other things that God could have given to them but Paul gets very conclusive inside of verse number 3 when he says that God's already given to you everything He intends for you to have and to live your Christian lives. He has already blessed you, he says, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And so in the language then of the Apostle Paul here, it's not that we need something more. It's not that we need something in addendum or some, some additional work of the Spirit of God inside of our life. No, uh, Paul prays for these individuals to simply realize what they all already have. And there's three expressions that make this crystal clear for us inside of the opening remarks of this prayer. Uh, first of all, uh, Paul is going to mention the Spirit of wisdom. He is going to pray, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that He may give unto you. Paul says, I am praying that our God will supply you with, will equip you with the Spirit of wisdom. Now the word Spirit here does not refer to the Holy Spirit and it doesn't refer to man's spirit. Now, rather, the word spirit here is to be understood as a disposition or an attitude. Now, Jesus uses the word in Matthew chapter number 5 in the Sermon on the Mount when He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. It's not, a, it's not blessed are the poor in the Holy Spirit or blessed are the poor in man's spirit, but it's blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter number 5, uh, blessed are those who are poor, those that are dependent or, or have an attitude or a disposition of dependency. It, it is to live life in dependence on the Spirit of God, right? Uh, this is how Jesus taught us to pray in the model prayer. We are to pray, give us this day our daily bread. It is the attitude or disposition that we are dependent upon God to supply and to meet our every need. The psalmist said uh, that he had been young and yet he was old now, and, but he had never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Uh, he's just simply, uh, uh, simply verbalizing the same truth uh, that believers look to God to meet their needs. He is the resource, right? Uh, Paul will, uh, will say later on that my God, Philippi, the book of Philippians, my God shall supply all your need. And this is exactly where believers look to for our, our needs and to be supplied. And so blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who are, who are spiritually dependent upon the Lord inside their life. So the word again, spirit here, uh, refers, to, uh, refers to an attitude or a disposition. And so Paul here, back in Ephesians 1 and verse 17, prays for these individuals to have a spirit, a attitude, or a disposition of wisdom. Literally, Paul is praying for them to be influenced by wisdom. Wisdom, then, in the sense of our ability to use what we are already aware of or already in possession of. Wisdom here is the very opposite of laziness. A lazy person wants more but doesn't want to use what they've already been given. They just want to, get, to be given to and to be given to, to receive and to receive, and they never really put into practice anything that they've already been given. But a wise person is content 
with what they've already received as they try to utilize what has already been supplied to them. And so this is this spirit of wisdom that the apostle here prays for, that these individuals wouldn't necessarily go out and look for some additional work of the spirit inside their life for some extra experience, but that they would just become more consciously aware of what they have already received and in wisdom would be putting such knowledge into practice. These believers then, as are all believers, have been supplied then with all spiritual blessings. Then the apostle is asking for God to help them utilize such blessings in their practices that they would have the spirit of wisdom. And the second thing that Paul prays for again in verse number 17 is not only that the Father would give unto them the spirit of wisdom, but also the spirit of revelation. The spirit of Revelation. Now, the word spirit, I, I understand, is only, uh, only used one time in relation to wisdom, but it applies to the idea of revelation as well. It's tied, if you will, to both terms. We need the spirit of wisdom, an attitude or disposition of wisdom, but we also need an attitude or disposition of revelation. The word revelation here speaks of an unveiling or a peeling back, if you will. Uh, again, it's not necessarily something new, but it's just to become aware of what has already been given. Of course, then, these believers had already been revealed certain truths. They have already, they have already had certain truths unveiled or peeled back for them. Otherwise, they wouldn't be saved. Uh, back in verse number 9 of Ephesians 1, Paul says that God had already made known unto us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure which He has purposed in Himself. So what is it that these believers have already had revealed to them? Well, just to name a couple of features, they had already had revealed to them their lost condition. These individuals have already become acutely aware of the fact that they were lost, word without end, minus the grace of God. Now, they had seen the exceeding sinfulness of their sin. They had seen themselves without hope in this world if they were to live without God. They had seen that their righteousnesses were as filthy rags before the Lord, that their righteousness must exceed the righteousness. It must go beyond the righteousness of the scribes and of the Pharisees, meaning they needed a different kind, a different sort of righteousness. What kind of righteousness did they need? Well, they had already become aware of that as well. They needed the righteousness of God's dear Son. We call that the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. And this is what those believers uh, had been uh, uh, exposed to by way of revelation. God's Spirit had worked by way of illumination to reveal their lost condition. It had worked on their behalf to reveal these truths. Uh, Paul would say that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that, loved, that love Him. But God has revealed those things to us, right? Uh, that is the message of the gospel. Uh, things that are uh, not able to be understood by those in the world at large, uh, those that are lost without God, uh, do not come to this realization by themselves. It is by way of the revelation of the Spirit of God working in their, in their life. And so these believers here that Paul is praying for have already been exposed, already been revealed to certain truths. That's why there are believers in the first place. But again here, uh, Paul here prays for more knowledge to be revealed to them. Uh, so, uh, so they've received knowledge, but Paul says they, they hadn't reached a stopping point of learning. They were to go on in their Christian experience, constantly, constantly learning more and more and more. Now, again, I think it's important to see that Paul is rather interested in their knowing something rather than experiencing something. Paul is more interested in their knowledge being increased than them being able to sit around a dinner table and talk about some, uh, some uh, supernatural thing that happened to them, uh, some, uh, some mystical occurrence of speaking some gibberish or, or uh, having some uh, outer body experience, if you will. Uh, Paul, Paul doesn't pray for that to take place for these Ephesians. He, he rather prays that they would be increased with, with knowledge, increased with a spirit, if you will, of revelation. He wants them to know something. Well, what kind of knowledge is it that the apostle prays for them? Well, he prays for them to be knowledgeable, verse number 17, of him. The spirit of wisdom, he says, and the spirit of revelation in the knowledge of 
Him. And Paul desires for these believers to know more about Christ. I like what uh, page 6 in our red book says, I want to know more about our Lord. This is the prayer of the Apostle Paul for these believers in Ephesus. This should be our prayer for ourselves here today that we would increase more and more in the knowledge of Christ throughout the longevity of our Christian experience. This is, this is what tends to Christian growth, to proper Christian growth. It's not someone just constantly beating you over the head. Uh, there's a time to rebuke, a time to reprove. Of course, that's two-thirds of preaching. Um, but there's the element of exhortation. That means just line upon line and precept upon precept and being increased with knowledge, the knowledge of God, being increased in, in understanding, having our eyes, he's going to say in verse number 18, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened. You know what we do as, as believers? We gather Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night on, in regular circumstances to learn more. Why do we praise, place such a premium on the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God? Why, why, do, we, uh, why do we ensure that those that, that teach our children and teach our adults here at Fellowship Baptist Church are well equipped to be able to properly train, properly teach? Why do we guard the pulpit so carefully as who stands behind it and preaches what thus saith the Lord? Well, it's because the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God, learning more and more about Jesus Christ, is what God has chosen to develop us spiritually speaking. And so again, Paul prays that they would be increased with the spirit of wisdom, increased in the spirit of knowledge, in the spirit of revelation, revelation in the knowledge, he says, of Him. We are to know more about Christ. I may I stop and say then here, uh, that, uh, that it is absolutely ridiculous how much worldly knowledge we have acquired to ourselves and how spiritually ignorant we have become. It is, I am constantly amazed at all that, uh, that so many people know in terms of, uh, of, in terms of the world's economy, how, uh, how smart we are when it comes to to sporting events and teams and, and recreation and, and we know this information and that information and we're, we're so astute in the, in the sciences and, and uh, historical truths. People, people have their hobbies and they, and they delve off into, into those arenas and there's, there's nothing wrong with having those kinds of, of interests but never, but never at the sacrifice of spiritual knowledge and of furthering our, our capacity of spiritual revelation inside of our life. And I say again, it is absolutely ridiculous how smart we are in the terms of this world and how ignorant we are in terms of, uh, of the knowledge of Christ. In fact, if there is any knowledge by and large associated with Christianity, it seems to have been reduced down to a bunch of rules. We've reduced Christianity down to a, to a bunch of rules, a bunch of uh, do this and don't do that, touch this and don't touch that. And, and it's just, uh, it's just a, a, a boundaryic kind of life. You can, you can go here but no further. And listen, standards and convictions and, and, uh, and boundaries are all essential parts of of the Christian life and there are places we ought not to go and things we ought not do and, and all kinds of things like that. But that's not the essence of what Christianity is about. Christianity is about an interaction and a life and an experience with the person of Christ. We become like Him because we learn of Him. We take His yoke upon us. Uh, that is, we assume who He is in our own character and our own nature. How different then would our world be, how different would our Christian lives be if we knew something of the loveliness of Christ? If we knew as much about Christ as we do about our own pet peeves inside of, the, inside of our Christian lives, how differently would those lives be? How differently would our testimony and our affections be if we just learn constantly more and more in regards to the person of Jesus Christ? And therefore, instead of praying for things as we so often do, we would utter a prayer much like the Apostle Paul does here. We would pray that God would further reveal His Son to us. Think to yourself, when's the last time that was on your prayer request? When's the last time that we sat down or knelt down or laid down prostrate and we began to, to call out to God and we prayed, God, please reveal Your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to me. Help me to know more about Him. Even in Bible study, it seems... 
Now, the average preacher just wants to stand up and give some new revelation, some new knowledge, something, uh, something different than everybody else has ever been able to grasp hold of. Listen, we're preaching, we're preaching the book divine. We don't need to make up things. We don't need to come up with spooky and mis mystical ways to interpret God's Word. Again, we're just called to utter line upon line, precept upon precept, and this is how believers are intended to develop spiritually speaking. And this is what the Apostle Paul craved for these believers. And this is what he really craved for himself. Remember over in Philippians chapter 3, verse number 10, of Paul's prayer for himself, he says that I may know Him. Now, Paul already knew Him, and he knew a lot about Him, but Paul wasn't content with his knowledge of Christ. He had, a, he had an increasing desire to know more about Christ, to know more about the fellowship of His sufferings, to know more about the power of His resurrection, to be made more conformable unto His death. Is this, a, is this the prayer request on our lips? Are we, are we praying for God to give us a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of revelation, or are we praying for, for an increase in pay? Are we praying for... A, are we praying for tangible items? Again, we are to let our requests be made known unto God, but, uh, but we are to be more spiritually minded to set our affection on things above and not so much on the things of the earth. Well, there's a third expression here that I want us to notice before we finish today in regards to just showing the overall theme of this prayer. Paul mentions again, verse number 17, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge coming over in the verse number 18. Here's the third expression that Paul uses he says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. This expression is very interesting and really further propounds Paul's desire of understanding and comprehension for these believers. The word understanding here inside of verse number 18 is in the Greek language, uh, the word cardia. Cardia. Uh, it means relating to the heart. Cardia in the Greek was translated into the Latin uh, cardiacus and then into English in the later 17th century, which is where we get our words cardio or cardiac in regards to uh, uh, getting your exercise in, you're building, uh, you're building a healthy heart. Uh, cardiac arrest would be the very opposite of that. So the idea of cardio or cardiac is the idea of something that is relating to the heart. And here's the basic form of that word used, again, inside of verse number 18, translated as the term understanding. Now, that may seem a bit confusing for us. Why would the word cardia, a, uh, a word used in relationship to the heart, be translated by the term understanding? Well, in the New Testament, the heart was considered to be the seat of intellect rather than the seat of emotions as we use it in our modern vernacular. Our modern uh, expression may be to say something of the effect of, I love you with all of my heart, or I love something with all of my heart. In the New Testament economy, they wouldn't have used the word in regards to some emotional stimuli like love. Rather, they might say that they knew something with all of their heart rather than love something with all of their heart. And therefore, Paul is not so interested here in them having some emotional experience as he is in their intellect being enlightened. Now Paul says, verse number 18, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. He says, I want you to have an open heart to the enlightenment of the Spirit of God working in your life. I want you to have an open heart. We would say it a little bit differently. We would say that we need to have an open mind to the Word of God. Here's, uh, here's one prevalent problem inside of Christianity. Everyone is so set in their ways that nobody can change. Now, we understand that, uh, that change isn't always necessarily a good thing. We are opposed to all forms of deviation and compromise. Uh, the Bible says, meddle not with them that are given to change. That is, those that are this way today and that way tomorrow, and they're, they're always like, a, uh, like, a, like the chaff which the wind driveth away, right? This kind, these kinds of individuals are not considered to be blessed individuals. But we always need to have an open heart, or if you will, an open mind to the truths of the Word of God. So much so that if we are in error, we need to have an open mind that we can be presented with the truth and, uh, and fall in line, if you will, with that same truth. Again, Paul is not so interested in them having, again, some kind of emotional stimuli, some emotional experience. He's not praying for, for them to just simply feel something with their heart. 
Uh, Paul is praying for them to know something with their heart. And therefore, the need of the hour for those believers and us was to have more light given in our understanding. Paul prays, I want you to be enlightened in your heart, enlightened in your understanding. So what does light do? Paul prays for light to be shown, further shown, further revealed inside of their hearts. What does light do then? Why, why the necessity of praying for light? Well, I would ask you a question. Does light produce something? Does light create anything new? Absolutely not. Light doesn't create anything. Light only reveals what is already present. And again, this is exactly the burden of Paul inside of this prayer. He, again, I can't stress enough that the apostle is not praying for something to be added to their Christian experience. He's only praying that the light would get cut on, that these believers would continue to become constantly more revealed, unveiled, to have the layers peeled off layer by layer for them to grow deeper and deeper and deeper in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. As I'm preaching, there are those of you that are listening and you've been saved, some of you for, for weeks and months, some of you have been saved for years, some of you decades. Uh, however long our Christian experience lasts inside of this earthly existence, we are to constantly be peeling back the layers, constantly learning more of Jesus Christ. And in all reality, we will never, ever exhaust the knowledge of Him, ever. And in part, I can't help but uh, mention this before we get down to concluding the message today, uh, that in part, Paul's prayer is answered uh, in our terms for these Ephesians and for us today. Now, Paul's prayer is answered in part by those faithful men and women that stand and teach us the Word of God. For those gentlemen that will stand behind pulpits much like this and faithfully proclaim the Word of God uh, this, this is why Paul said in regards to the qualifications of a bishop, an elder, a pastor, that he is to be apt to teach, right? Because we need to increase our knowledge of Him. And so to stand behind a pulpit or to stand behind a lectern inside of a Sunday school class and teach adults or to teach children in some capacity, that, that, we, are, that we are able, we are capable, we are apt to convey those truths. And again, this is in part a, a prayer uh, an answer to the prayer of the Apostle Paul that God is using such men and women in our lives and the lives of our family members to increase, to, to further give us the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of revelation, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened. Why? So that we could know more about Jesus Christ. We could grow closer to Him inside of our experience. And ultimately, when we see Him, we then will be like Him. This is the climax, of course, of our Christian experience. The Apostles' prayer here is for these believers to know more about what has already been supplied for them in their Christian lives. And this should be our desire as well for us and other believers. We should pray for ourselves. God, increase our knowledge of Christ and all that He has done for us. And we should in return pray for our children, our spouses, our family, our friends. We should pray for them as believers that God would increase their realization of these truths. Now Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 12, Now he, we have received, he says, not the spirit of this world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. That is, we have already discovered some truths, just like these believers in Ephesus, but we have not yet even skimmed the surface for the depth of knowledge concerning all that Christ has supplied us with by His death, burial, and resurrection, and the impartation of our new life by being born again. Remember, again, back in verse number 3, we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, and it is our responsibility through the length of our days to come to a better understanding of all of those blessings. The man of God, the preacher, uh, the pastor, the Sunday school teacher, the evangelist, the missionary is going to stand week after week and he's going to simply tell you more and more and more and more about Jesus Christ. And in return, something is happening on the inside of us. We are being transformed more and more into Christ 
likeness. God is giving to us then the key here to correct spiritual growth. It is to learn more about Him and all that He has ever done for us. Now next week we're going to come back to this particular uh, prayer that the Apostle is offering here. And we're going to see a specific aspect of knowledge that Paul specifically wanted for these believers. He wanted the increase of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. He wanted all of these things so that these individuals could know the hope that had been given to them and the riches that had waited them as the saints of God. And so we'll be back next week and we'll uh, continue looking at this prayer of knowledge that Paul wanted these believers and us uh, to have fulfilled inside of our lives. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the privilege of the Word of God, for the testimony of Scripture, and even for the example of the Apostle Paul's prayer here that we might glean from it truths that we could govern our lives by and live by, to see the emphasis that Paul made upon the realization and the appropriation of truths and resources that have been supplied to us by the graciousness of our God in affording our salvation for us. God, would you equip us further with the spirit of wisdom, of revelation, and that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, further continuously illuminate our minds, our hearts, to receive with meekness the engrafted Word of God, which was able to save our souls and will help to continue to save us from this untoward generation. God, help us is our prayer. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.